Oh, put my scripture up there, Brother Ezekiel. I'm telling you, Brother Crow, you got some beautiful people here. I'm telling you. Don't look at the empty seats and groan and cry and carry on. Come on, Because, <laughs> you know, Mr. Smart Alex's not sitting over there. He's gone because God put him out the door. Sister Flirt used to flirt around here with everybody, but God put her out the door. That seat's empty. If y'all ever heard, if y'all ever had a, a flirt in the church, anyway, none of my business. But I've had a few. And Sister Spiritual, the the the. Oh, I better back off because. Oh, the depth of the riches. Both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways. You will never be able to figure God out. The best thing you can do is just follow God, walk by faith. But if I could tonight, I would like to attempt, and I say attempt, I emphasize the word attempt because that's all I can do. Because this is so big, it's going to be over some of you's head, and I'm sorry. Amen. But I like them messages, amen, that, that kind of take us somewhere. I'd like to speak tonight about being able to see the big picture. The big picture. And if you ever get discouraged, it's because you're not seeing the big picture. There's a big picture. There's more to life than what you're seeing. There's more going on than what you are realizing. It's not just getting up and going to work and paying bills and all that stuff. There's something else going on. And um, only the Bible tells us what the big picture is. Do you love your Bible? Well, first chapter of Genesis says God stepped out, and there was darkness upon the face of the deep, and, and God, the anointing, that's that's. What was in Jesus, the, he, the word became flesh. No, the word was made flesh. Let's get it exactly right. And when God said, let there be light, light came into existence. I believe that's when God clothed himself with light because the, the light of the sun, moon, and stars didn't happen until the fourth day, but that's another story. All we know is God spoke to this planet Earth. No other planet that we know of has fungus, has a weed, has a blade of grass. There is nothing, no life anywhere that we know of except on this planet. I know that don't mean a lot to everybody, but man's going into outer space trying to find evidence of evolution, and he can't find it. Can't find it. Don't tell me the space program is a neat little deal. It's an attempt by atheists and agnostics to try to prove that there's no God, so they're not responsible for their sin, their wickedness, and their evil. But, folks, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> we know what's going on. I don't believe everything I read, and I don't believe everything I see unless I see it in the Word of God. At, le at any rate, I've got to, God spoke and created life on this earth, and I, I don't know the motive, and I don't know all of what's going on, but we know that something went wrong. There was an evil force in the creation, and we assume that it was Lucifer, Satan, the great red dragon, and there's a whole lot of speculation about the serpent that came and tempted the woman. And because Adam lived for a period of time without a wife, 
And the Bible says it wasn't good. He had great love, value, and appreciation for that dear woman. But he chose her over God. And I guess you could probably say, well, God just kind of slapped his forehead and said, well, it was a good idea at the time. I really thought it was a good idea. But look at what happened. No, that's not what God did. His ways are past finding. His judgments are unsearchable. Lucifer was running around in the garden, bragging on himself, patting himself on the back, saying, look what I did. I overthrew the plan of God. But the book of Proverbs says there's no wisdom nor understanding nor knowledge against the Lord. And the Bible says, if the princes of this world, if they would have known, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. Oh, God's got a plan. I know you're going through troubles and trials and difficulties and problems, and, and we all have a veil of tears. We all got a story. But let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. If you could get a glimpse of the big picture, you wouldn't be down in the dumps tonight. You would be excited. You would be excited about living for God. You would be excited about being in the bride of Christ. You would be excited about what God has planned for them that love him. I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Oh, yeah, God had all these angels. There are cher cherubims, there are seraphims, there are archangels, and there are different ranks of angels, and they are, some of them are powerful, some of them are huge angels. And we read about Gabriel that appeared to Daniel, and uh, his, his face flashed like lightning. And when Daniel saw that angel, it threw him on the ground. He had no breath left in him. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, God has got some powerful creatures. But in God's mind, before the foundation of the world, he knew. He knew. He foreknew. And uh, I think, no, I'm, I'm speculating. I'm trying to, I, I think I'm right on this. This is way out in ozone, but you be the judge. I kind of believe that God was thinking I would like to have a new category of angels, of heavenly inhabitants that love me more than all the other angels, that love me because they know what it's like to be in the gutter. They know what it's like to be lost. They know what it's like for the devil to beat them up. They know what depression feels like. They know what evil feels like. But I'm going to come and give every drop of blood in the body of my son. Now, that's another story, and we don't want to get into the oneness of God. But, ladies and gentlemen, there is a man, there is a man that submitted to God in every area of his life, and we need to give Jesus credit for everything. I know he was God. He is God. He revealed God. But that humanity said, not my will, but thine be done. And we need to understand that God is creating a brand new group of heavenly inhabitants. And I know you're going through trials and troubles and tr difficulties and problems, and, and the devil's telling you, you you ain't living for God. The devil's fought me all my life. When I was a new convert, I'll never forget, Satan came to me and said, well, you had the Holy Ghost. Yeah, yeah, you, you had it, but you ain't got it now because you can't feel the Lord. And every Sunday afternoon, my, 
I lived in a home where my parents didn't live for God. My brother didn't live for God, but my mother encouraged me to go on to church. And But I would get depressed. Anybody, anybody ever have depression? Most of the time, that's from the spirit world. I was just a kid. I didn't know. I never saw the big picture. I was just a kid sitting on the pew, kind of like these boys right here. And I didn't know that I could rebel. It never, it never crossed my mind. I know it's crossed some of you guys' minds, but when they got up there in that pulpit, I thought that was God talking. And really it was. But every Sunday afternoon, I'd get depressed. The devil was trying to stop me from going to church. And one day, oh, I thank God for my struggles. It shows me that this Bible is right. It shows me that the devil don't want us to go in the rapture. The devil does not want us to succeed in our aspirations of taking the place of all those angels that were cast out. But one Sunday, I drug myself into the house of God. I thought I was backslid. You know, when you first start living for God, you're not sinless. You mess up. You don't realize that you have an advocate with the Father. You don't know the Bible. All you know is you felt good when you got the Holy Ghost. And so I just went on to church anyway. Thank God. I went to church thinking I was backslid, thinking I'd lost the Holy Ghost. Let me tell you, I don't think you ever lose the Holy Ghost unless you blaspheme the Holy Ghost. I think there's backsliders. No, no they're, they're straying children of God on the streets of Phoenix, Arizona right now, and they still have the baptism of the Holy Ghost on the inside of them, but it's not active and they're lost and they need to come back to God. But they're still children of God like the prodigal son was. We had a young man in our church years ago. And uh, he got married to a young lady. And he kind of, I never could hardly get him to pray. He was very talented. He was, he was a people person. You got to watch those people with talent, you know. Those people that don't have much talent, we, we got to depend on the Lord. Really, I'm serious. Uh, he kind of got lukewarm and kind of had a little problem with his wife, and it's a long story. Anybody have a problem with your wife? Huh? Anyway. <laughs> well, he got, to, he got to lay in carpet in Connecticut a long ways from Topeka, Kansas. And we prayed for him. I was praying one day. I said, Lord, I was driving down the road. And I said, Lord, what's going to happen to him? And I called his name. And I heard God speak to me. And he said, it just depends on how much you pray for him. I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to pray enough. I started praying. I'm telling you, folks. God hears our prayers. I prayed and prayed and prayed, and he said he, one night he was laying in bed a long ways from home, a long ways from his wife, backslid. And he said he could hear the devil laughing at him, and he couldn't go to sleep. Anybody ever heard the devil laugh? I have too. And when he's laughing... You don't feel very good because he's laughing because he's stopping you from cooperating with the big plan that God has. And he said, I turned over and tried to ignore that laughter in my mind. And he said, finally, I realized that I probably wasn't going to get any sleep all night long. And so he said, I just raised up in the bed. And he said, devil, I want you to know, I know I'm not where I ought to be. I know I'm not doing like I ought to do. 
but I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And he said, the laughing stopped. And he laid down and went to sleep. And we saw him a day or two later come back to church. And him and his wife were embracing in the house of God. And God put back together what the devil was trying to tear up. Oh, I said all that to say this, folks. The devil don't want you to be in heaven. He does not want you to take his place. And there was one-third of the angels. As far as we know, we don't know for sure that there was one-third of the angels that fell. All we know is the tail of the dragon drew one-third of the stars, and that seems to be an indication. But we don't know. We don't. We just get a little snapshot of what's going on. But what we get out of this Bible, I believe it with all my heart. And there are people that have died and went into the spirit world, left their body. One guy in particular, he was a Baptist preacher. Oh, it's fascinating to, to hear his testimony. Amen. He said that he went before the very gates of heaven in the spirit realm. And he said, God, I want you to spare my life like you did Hezekiah. Let me go back into life and extend my life. I've lived for you all my life. I've opened my home to orphans. I've preached on the street corner. And he said, when God opened his mouth, all of the thunder and lightning and all of the rivers and all, nothing in nature could ever compare to the voice of God that spoke to him. And he said, Harold Pittman, you have never lived for me. Your works were nothing. You are part of the Laodicean church. I never was your God. Your God was you. You were your own God. And your religion is a placebo religion. You know what a placebo is, don't you? Well, long story short, that man come back into his body, got the baptism of the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues, sold everything he had, went around the world giving his testimony. And I'm not, I'm not putting a lot of credence in death, near-death experiences, but when they kind of go along with what we believe, I kind of think there might be something to it. Folks, I really do believe you have to be born of water and spirit to enter the kingdom of God. I really do believe that Without the Holy Ghost, I mean, yes, there's good people that shake hands and join the church and sign cards, and I thank God for all the wonderful Catholics, and there's beautiful people everywhere. But Jesus said, He that believeth on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And John in parenthesis uh, told us what the river of living water was, but this spake he of the Spirit which they that believe on him should receive because the Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. There had to be an atonement in that temple up there in heaven where Satan had defiled the very holy place of God. And when Jesus ascended, he took his own blood and he purged that place and he sat down in the majesty on high. And he mediates in our behalf. I know for a fact, ladies and gentlemen, that we have a throne of grace that we can go to to obtain grace. And it's occupied. The seat of that throne is occupied by a human being that has been tempted in all points like as we are. Yet he never sinned. You want to see Jesus someday? I do. You got to hang in there, folks. I know you're feeling good right now. This is Sunday night. Come Thursday, you may not feel all this good. <laughs> I know that you love your man of God right now, but the devil can come along and discombobulate you like you have never experienced in all of your life. And, um, I just want you to know you need to be prepared for an attack. And the attack 
is going to come against you. It's going to come against your family. It's going to come against this church. And it's really good right now, but life is full of storms. And I've often thought about Simon Peter. Boy, if Peter, Peter could have saved himself a lot of trouble. You know that. He didn't see the big picture. You know, Jesus said, well, I've I'm, I'm got to go die, and I've got to go shed my blood, and they're going to slap me and spit on me. And Peter grabbed him and said, no, we ain't going to let that happen. <laughs> you know, Peter, don't be stupid, okay? No, you ain't going to do that. Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. For you savor not the things of God, but you're just thinking about the things of men. You're seeing the little bitty T90 picture. And then to top it off, you know, Peter had to stick his nose into what was going on. You know, if Peter would have just, when they came to get Jesus, after he sweat blood in the Garden of Gethsemane, after Jesus told him, wake up, here they are, just like I told you. If Peter would have just said, Lord, I just want you to know, it's been a wonderful three and a half years. I'm just going home, and I'm going to crawl in bed and go to sleep because you told me what was going to happen, and I'm not going to interfere. No, Peter couldn't do that. He followed it far off, and he, he, he got himself into temptation. He wound up cursing and denying, and he wound up, with the devil saying, I'd sure like to sift him as wheat. Peter is kind of a smart aleck. Peter thinks he knows more than his pastor knows. And Jesus in the spirit realm looked at Simon and said, Simon, I there's a devil out there. And he knows how to discombobulate your thinking. He wants to separate the good from the bad in you. He wants to take all the good out of you. And I'm telling you, folks, the devil can do that. God wants to take all the bad out of you and leave you with all the good. But I prayed for you that your faith fail not. I love that. He didn't say, I, I prayed for you that you could be a great success. I, he, he didn't say, I, I prayed for you that, that you might be able to preach a, a great message on the day of Pentecost. He said, I prayed for you that your faith fail not. He didn't pray that Peter wouldn't go through a great trial of his life. He didn't pray that Peter would have the devil come along and work on him. And for a period of time, Peter was backslid. But the difference in Peter and Judas was Judas premeditated what he was going to do. Now, Judas did repent, but he didn't repent like Peter did. Peter had really no premeditation of denying Jesus. He was overtaken in a fault. It was just a spur of the moment. But Judas planned and connived, and he didn't get prayed for. Folks, let me tell you, I'm warning you, there's a devil that never gives up, and we've got to be vigilant for our adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, goeth about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist stead fast. If you'll just resist the devil, he'll flee from you. You have the power that it takes to be saved. Can you say amen? Well, I could preach on and on and on, but we get over there to the book of Revelation. Isn't that a fabulous book? Oh, I need to read the book of Ephesians, the first chapter. And uh, it says, <laughs> I love this because it kind of kind of gives us a little picture of the Lord God of heaven and his plan and what's going on in our world. 
Galatians and then Ephesians, you know, that's where the Ephesians is located. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all heavenly blessings and heavenly places in Christ. What is that word, in Christ? According, next verse, as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Next verse. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ, to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. You know what that means? He loves us just as much as he loves Jesus, his only begotten son. Next verse. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Next verse. In whom also we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Next verse. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Next verse. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. Folks, if you can get the mystery of his will, and if you can understand this mystery, you ain't going to go back out there in the world. You're not going to do it. If you can see the big picture, you won't trade your beautiful, wonderful place in heaven for some kind of a dance hall or a high on a drug. Next verse. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. That in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. Hey, it's all in him. Everything is in that man. Everything is in the son. I know we're oneness and we don't believe in the Trinity. I'm not preaching Trinity. I'm not giving you Trinitarian scriptures. This is a oneness verse of scripture. And God did have a son, and that son was not another God. That son was the man Christ Jesus, where God lives and he forever lives in that man. And we will always behold God in the face of that man Christ Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? Let me read that again. That in the fullness of the in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So, the singing that we heard tonight was beautiful. But there's going to be some more beautiful singing, a whole lot better than this. Because John was in a prison. And one day the Lord said, John, I want you to come on up a little higher. I want to show you something you've never seen before. I want to show you the big picture. What he saw, he couldn't write it all down. We got a thumbnail sketch of what John saw. But one of the things that John saw is so unique. He heard a choir singing. 14th chapter of the book of John. Come on, Sister Con. We need a beautiful song right now. And it was a bunch of people that had been redeemed from the earth. A group of people that knew something the angels didn't know. That knew what it felt like to feel lost that knew what it felt like to be beat up by the devil, be depressed. Angels have never experienced that. They can't sing this song, the song of the redeemed. So, folks, I guess that's the long and the short of it, folks. You want to be in that choir? I promise you, 
Sister Erica, you sung good tonight, but you're going to sing a whole lot better over there. Oh, uh, well, I'm trying to remember names right now. I enjoyed watching you worship God. You leaping and jumping and worshiping God was so fabulous. And I don't want to pump you up, but you're going to sing a whole lot better over there. I've noticed that, well, we've got people in our church. One boy, he was an orphan. His name is Junior. You remember Junior. That's Tiana's older brother. Junior was really an orphan. He got picked up on the Sunday school bus because his mother was a drug addict. And one day the SRS or whoever it is, the customer service has come and got all the kids and put them in a foster home. And one of the kids looked up and said, well, right there, that's the church that we've been going to. They've been picking us up on the bus. Junior was adopted by a family in our church. Oh, I could tell you what all that boy's been through. But I've noticed people that have been abused, misused, taken advantage of, hurt, suffer, they sing so much better than anybody else. Have you noticed that? I think about my wife. She sings beautiful. They come with a big price. Because her dad left her. I, I shouldn't tell this. She could tell it a whole lot better. She had a stepdad that verbally physically abused her and her brother. But don't feel sorry for Sister Khan. Because of that pain and because of that sorrow. A good Assembly of God guy come by their neighborhood, knocked on their door and said, can I take your children to church? And her mother was a backslide, backslid oneness. Yeah, that's okay. And one day, they were having a revival at that little Assembly of God church. And they said, would you like to come back tonight? Because her heart was broken. Because she was searching. Because she was hungry. Because she was suffering. All things work together for the good. So... What the devil meant for evil, God meant it for good. She said, yeah, I want to go to church. She said, she don't remember what they sung. I want her to give her testimony, but it's so fabulous. As a 14-year-old little girl, she never had a sermon about speaking in tongues. But the preacher preached and she said she remembered there was a move of God. They had tongue and interpretation. You know them old assembly of God people, you really didn't have it. Yes. And she said, they said, well, if you want to pray, go oh, right over here. There's a place to pray right over here. She went over there by herself. Nobody laid hands on her. And she started speaking in tongues. She got the Holy Ghost. Her mother wasn't there. Her stepdad wasn't there. But she took the Holy Ghost home. And her older brother got the Holy Ghost. He's a pastor in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Got a great church. And I suppose, ladies and gentlemen, must be reason the Lord said hey boy that's your wife right there now, she's not perfect but she's the real deal I thank God for my dear wife and I'm just going to turn it over to her right now 
God bless you, Sister Con. Sing for us or testify, whatever you feel. I do feel like the Lord gave me a word this morning. Early when I woke up. I think I'm going to sing first, if you don't mind. When I walk through the door, I sensed God's presence and I knew this was the place where love abounds for this is the temple
praise him. Come on, somebody praise him. Just praise him right now. We are standing in his presence. We're on holy ground. There is joy. I want to tell you, God's in this place right now. Hallelujah. I don't know what your needs are, but I'm telling you, he's just saying, step up. Step up. Come on, I'm right here. Very early this morning, um, I was reading my Bible, and the Lord brought this to my mind. And I just want to tell you that, now the Lord spoke to several of you tonight. And God has given you some promises. God has done some things tonight, and he, you feel like he has said, thus and thus, I'm going to do this in your life. <clears throat> but the devil tries to come and get us sidetracked. And one of the biggest ways that he can get us sidetracked is if we start looking at somebody else. And what they should have done or what they should have said. There are several different leaders in the Bible, and I, I'm not talking about the leadership ministry as such tonight. So don't think this doesn't. If you want to sit down a second, you can. I'm not going to be here very long, but if you want to sit down, you're welcome to. Uh, you know, sometimes what I'm going to talk to you about for just a few minutes, I'm not talking about Brother Crow. I'm not talking about the leadership team. I'm talking about you as a leader in your church and your community. Okay. We read in the Bible about a couple of different leaders that I just want to parallel tonight. This is what the Lord. One of the biggest ways the enemy tries to get us sidetracked is to get our focus on criticizing others. Every one of us, and I brought, I touched on this just a little bit yesterday, but I want to, every one of us have things that happen to us in our lives. Yes. You heard my husband briefly mention about my, my own life. My real dad left us when I was just a very, I was just born. Matter of fact, he had already gone before I was even born. And my mother had a very hard life raising two small children, walking to work, no car, trying to raise us. And we went through a lot. But I can sit back and build a shrine to all the bad things that's happened in my life. And some folks do that. They build a monument. And this is what they say, you don't know what I've been through. But let me tell you what you've been through. You've been through the altar and you've been through the blood of Jesus. And when we came to the altar, the blood of Jesus washed away our past. <clears throat> One of the preachers that used to preach for us, he used to say this, don't be a bone digger. Now, if you don't understand that, dogs go out and dig up stuff. Don't go dig up your past. Your past hurts, your past whatever's happened to you. Because when you do, those things are will turn into unforgiveness and unforgiveness will turn into bitterness there are a couple of kinds of leaderships that I want to I would just want to bring to you just a little bit <clears throat> we can't judge others it's not our job and I know people say well the Bible says judge them by the fruits well that's only just so you understand what kind of a person that is that is I always tell people if if you see something that somebody's doing that's a problem God gave you that to pray for them he didn't bring that to you so you can say oh you know what someone so is doing I saw did you hear I just want to let you know you know everybody I want everybody to know you know what you're supposed to be doing is taking it to the person that can that's fix right. it all right David was a man after God's own heart, the Bible says. Was he perfect? No, he was not. He was mistreated 
by the leader, Saul. David could have killed Saul. He had several opportunities. There will be leaders that will be harsh. So what do we do with these situations? When Abishai wanted to kill Saul, who had been very unkind, very harsh to David. And David said, what did he say? Go get him. He's a bad guy. He needs to be punished. No, the Lord said, David said, the Lord judge between me and thee. In other words, God's going to decide. Now Saul, on the other hand, when he heard the story that David has slain his thousand, Saul has slain his thousand, David has slain his ten thousand. He didn't like that. He wanted to be number one. He should have been glad that he was bringing a leader up behind him that knew how to swing the sword. But instead, he focused on himself and criticized those that were around him. And so when Saul had a chance to kill David, he tried to. David's leadership or Saul's leadership. The Bible tells us that there was a man named Rechab and Bannon, I might not even say it right, but the sons of Rimmon went to Ishbah's house, and that was the son of Saul, snuck in and killed Ishbah and brought him to his head to David. Guess what we did? We got Ishbah's head today. And David said, Am I supposed to be happy about that? that you snuck in and killed an innocent man? He said, I'm going to tell you just what I told somebody else. There was another guy that came to me and said, we have killed Saul. And he said, I had him killed. And he said, take these two guys and kill them. Cut their hands off, cut their feet off for what that means. And then they took the head and buried it. So, what I'm saying is, do you want to be like David? Let, let's go on. Let me go one more, and then I'm going to quit. David, when Saul and Jonathan were killed, Saul had a son called Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth. And the nurse was running with him, and she dropped him, and he became a cripple the rest of his life. Now, that was not something that people were proud of. It was not something they put up on the, on the stage. It was something that they kept hid. But the Bible says that after Saul died, he said, is there any left? <sighs> he could have said, Brother Crow, is there any of my enemies still out there? Somebody get the gun and kill them. But he said, is there anybody in the house of Saul still left that I can show honor to? Who do you want to be like? Who do you want to be like? Do you want to be like Saul? The Bible said he was head and shoulders above everybody. He looked good, Brother Crow. But he never let God work on him. David allowed God to bring difficulties in his life and could still stand up and say, The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Like Job said, Blessed be the name of the Lord difficulties will come your way. Be careful who you crucify. Learn to always be merciful because we will need mercy.